Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show that tells you how they made their mark. He writes Nevada Yesterdays for Nevada Humanities and KNPR, an author who has penned many books that include Freedom, Union, and Power, Lincoln, and his party during the Civil War. He's an editor, an associate professor of history at UNLV. He attended Columbia University and teaches in 19th century America and in Nevada and Las Vegas history. He's a member of the board of directors of the Mob Museum and the executive director of Pacific Coast Branch of American History Association. Let's welcome in Michael Green. Michael, welcome to the show. Hi, Tommy. Thanks for having me. So I'm excited. We're going to talk about the Tropicana, but the time that this gets aired will be have been shut down. But before we get there... Let's go here. How long have you been a resident of Las Vegas? How long have you been here? <laughs> <laughs> Too long, in the opinion of some people. Um, my family moved here in 1967. And if you want to uh, narrow it down a little, I was two. You can figure it out from there. <laughs> and uh, the big issue at the time, with my mother liked to recall, was that Sears was moving out of downtown way, way out of town where nobody lived at the Boulevard Mall at Maryland and Desert Inn. <laughs> so uh, l- let's just say uh, I've seen a few changes. Yes, you have. Well, least. And, and let's put it this way. Uh, my dad was fired personally from his dealing job by the guy De Niro played in Casino. Okay, Lefty Rosenthal. Yeah, and uh, I worked at a newspaper, the Valley Times, that oh. uh, broke a lot of the stories about Lefty and others while also uh, getting in some trouble of its own. So I have a checkered past for a history professor. Does that where the organized crime interest comes from? Was the Valley Times or was it before then? I think it's a combination. I think it's knowing of something going on when I was a kid. Okay. I worked at the paper when I was a teenager, so mm. I was still a kid. And I was an undergrad at UNLV at the time. And one of the beauties of being out here is that if you want to do local history, here are the sources. This is where they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, The mob's a little harder. Uh, There's a Woody Allen line that I quote, that organized crime saves a lot of money on office supplies. (laughs) Uh, There isn't much written down, although ironically, a Kansas City mobster who was a bit obsessed with writing things down is one of the reasons uh, that they were able to figure out who was skimming at the Tropicana. Correct. <laughs> so it all comes together in the end somehow. It does. And you've segued beautifully right into the Tropicana. And when you think about the Tropicana, like what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Mm. Well, I admit that I'm a little biased in this because at one point I was hired to do a history project by the Housels family. And specifically, J. Kel Housels Jr. and his wife, Nancy. And Kel Housels Jr. ran the Tropicana with and for his father for a few years in the old days. But I think of the Foley Berger, mm. the long-running show. I think of the connection to UNLV, believe it or not. When UNLV was started and there were maybe three buildings, the joke was that the Tropicana uh, coffee shop or country club was the faculty club. They'd go there and they'd have their meetings. And apparently one night, Sammy Davis Jr. came to a meeting and started dancing on the table. I had to kick him out of the department meeting. So I think of it in a variety of ways. And now I think of it as yet another uh, hotel of our past, of the classic strip uh, that we're going to lose. While at the same time, I'm a historian and a preservationist, I also understand why that happens. I'm with Maybe you. even has to happen. Yeah, it's sad to see the classic Las Vegas leave. And I've said this before. It is almost like we're into phase three. Phase one to me was the classic Las Vegas that everybody remembers back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The mega resort started coming in with the Mirage and then it continued to go. And now it seems like we're in phase three because now the Mirage is going to be changing hands to the Hard Rock and they're going to mm-hmm. kill the guitar shaped tower there. And it just seems like we're heading into phase three. And that's the reason why I wanted to do this show on the Tropicana. It's a property, listeners, if you're not familiar with it, it will be demolished to pave away for the new Las Vegas A Stadium. It's closing on April 2nd, 2024, which is, it's already been closed by the time you're hearing this. It's not closed currently, but it will be by then. 
I'm going to give you some facts, and then I'm going to let Michael chime in on some of the old times of the Tropicana. Tony Sherman was the architect, and Taylor Construction was the general contractor. 30 investors that included Morton Downey, who had 5%, and it was leased to a guy that they called Dandy Phil, who was associated with <laughs> the Genovese and New Orleans crime families. I want to take it right there from you, Michael. What do you know about Dandy Phil and all this connection to the trop? Well, the guy who was starting to build it was Ben Jaffe, who had the Fontainebleau in Miami. And here's an irony for you. We finally have gotten the Fontainebleau opened in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. And Jaffe was out of money. He had to sell his percentage of the Fontainebleau. And Castell was one of the people the state said, uh-uh. And the reason is that, uh, well, first of all, let's face it. If you're in the mob and you don't have a nickname, you know, the, you, you haven't made it yet. True. We don't have Lefty Rosenthal. Okay. Well, Dandy Phil had actually worked with Arnold Rothstein mm. back in New York. And Rothstein is the subject of one of the great lines in movie history where uh, they mention him in The Godfather Part Two, I believe it is. Where, uh, yeah, uh, I've always honored him. He fixed the 1919 World Series. <laughs> well, yeah, the whole Black Sox scandal, all that goes back to Rothstein. And then after Rothstein... You have guys like Lucky Luciano and then Frank Costello. And Castell is tied to Costello. And he's in New York. He goes to New Orleans, where he continues the connection to New York, and he's involved in gambling down there. And, of course, we're talking about a period where Nevada is the only state where gambling is legal. Mm -hmm. But if you think there's no other gambling going on, well, I, I have a Brooklyn Bridge I'd like to sell you. <laughs> And Dandy Phil was involved in all that stuff, and they know he's connected to the families in New Orleans and the people in New York. So he's kind of persona non grata to the state. And a little extra background in this for what it's worth. When the Tropicana was under construction starting in 55, that's when we first got the State Gaming Control Board. Mm. And we got that because there had been an expose in the Las Vegas Sun where it came out that Meyer Lansky was a hidden owner of the Thunderbird, which wasn't that well hidden. I suspect a lot of people in Las Vegas would have said, oh, yeah, well, all right, well, okay. Uh, but this inspires the state to expand its investigations, and Dandy Phil runs into that. So he's out, but it doesn't mean the mob's out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the investors were to use an old gambling term, square johns, meaning they're, you know, they're just business people who want to get a couple of points in a casino, whatever. I don't think Morton Downey is connected. He's a singer. Yeah, he's an right. entertainer. Yep. Didn't Sammy Davis as well have a small percentage at one time in the trop as well? He may have at some point, but, you know, you will often find names of entertainers showing up in various projects, and it really depends now, how much of it is just, oh, we're just putting their name out there and mm -hmm. so on. Um, I don't think Sammy ever had to be licensed, whereas Sinatra and Martin did have to be. They both were involved in casino ownership, though Dean, being Dean, uh, he once said something like, I have a point in the sands. That means I have 10 percent of four mobsters, <laughs> uh, which uh, apparently the mobsters thought was funny, but some <laughs> others don't. Right. <laughs> right. You know, it was advertised as the Tiffany of the Strip when it opened. But was it when it opened, was there already rumblings that it was connected to the mob or did that come in later? Oh, there were rumblings before it opened. Oh, before it, it opened. That. Before it opened. Uh, partly Dandy Phil, partly Jaffe coming out of Miami, uh, because if you had anything to do with Miami, automatically you were thought to have something to do with Lansky, whether or not you did. And it was common. If you go up and down the Strip in 1957 when the Tropicana opens, the El Rancho Vegas was the first one on the Strip. By this time, it's owned by a guy who had some interesting connections. And there are some people out of uh, Detroit and out of Mississippi and the frontier. And you just continue down the street. And the Sahara was the one that was often considered clear of the mob. And they had a couple of questionable characters in there. I think it was inevitable. So Las Vegas didn't get in a dither about this. And I did the oral history of an attorney named Ralph Denton, 
who represented a couple of different casino owners in his time, but more of a general practitioner. And Ralph had the line, you know, nobody walked around with a sign saying, hi, I'm Mo from the Cleveland mob. So nobody really thought about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what you've done. Okay, well, now you're out here. Are you obeying the law? As it turned out, no. But it's soon after the Tropicana opens that we find out there's a little more of a connection than people realize. And that is that about, oh, less than a month after the opening, uh, Frank Costello gets shot in New York City, apparently uh, by Vinnie the Chin. Right. And he's later acquitted. But the police check his pockets, Costello's pockets, and they find a piece of paper with a number on it. And it turns out that it's the amount of money the Tropicana had made in its first weeks. And I'm not convinced the state had yet been notified. Mm. And the handwriting belonged to a guy named Lou Letterer, who was supposedly running the casino with another guy named Mickey Colohan. And they're supposed to be acceptable to the state. And they appear to be in touch with Frank Costello. And that's not good. <laughs> no, it's not good. No, that's... And, and mind you, when I say that, let's go back for a minute to Aurea connected to the mob. You get to the later mob where Lefty Rosenthal has a TV show, mm. you know, that sort of thing. And you go back to the line in the movie Bugsy, where Lansky says to Siegel, you're becoming famous, Benny. It's good for Joe DiMaggio. It's not good for you. Well, you don't want to be famous. And if you're connected to Frank Costello, you're connected to someone famous, and you should be keeping that under wraps. Another name that pops in, you already mentioned, Foley Berger, which ended in 2009 after almost 50 years and is still the longest running show in Las Vegas history. Joe mm -hmm. Augusto, who had no mm -hmm. gaming license, was the owner who oversaw the skim for the Kansas City crime family. And Foley Berger was featured in the 1964 film Viva Las Vegas as well, listeners, if you want to go back and see it. But here's another person of Joe Augusto that's connected to the mob, but has no gaming license. And just like in that movie Casino, they say you don't need a gaming license. You'll change your, you change your name. We'll put it to the bottom of the, of the pile. He's running a, a theater show, but he's really there for the mob. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, to work in the Foley Berger history. Uh, the Tropicana opened with a review, and the first big performer, the star of the review, was Eddie Fisher, mm. big singer. And they bring in a bunch of different people. But when the Stardust opened in 1958, oh, and the Tropicana, they think we have to do something. So it was actually Kel Housels Jr. who went to Paris to negotiate the deal. And the original entertainment manager, producer for when Foley Berger started was named Lou Walters who had been involved in some places in New York and had a daughter named Barbara. Mm. And just to remind you how small the world is, at one point she was married to a guy named Merv Adelson, who was business partners <laughs> with Erwin Mulaski and Mo Dalitz and Allard <laughs> Rowan and the Paradise Development Company. So it's a small world after all. And we're in adult Disneyland, so we can use the, the song. But by the time Augusto comes in, they cleared out the mob in the early days. And then when... Housels and company sold, the mob worked its way back in. And the supposed owner at the time Augusto was there was a chemical heiress named Mitzi Stauffer Briggs. Stauffer Chemical. And she knew nothing about casinos. And this is not a comment on anyone in particular, but if you don't know the casino business when you're running a casino, you are ripe for the plucking. And Augusto was in there. He was an old, longtime mob guy. And he took the title of entertainment director. So he's technically the producer of the Foley Berger, which is fine. He gets to audition acts, which is what the producers do, and, and run the show and so on. But, of course, he's really there to watch over the skim. And at the same time, Rosenthal, because he couldn't be licensed, for a time was listed as the entertainment director at the Stardust, and at one point, the guy who'd been the entertainment director at the Tropicana in the 60s, Maynard Sloat, he was down at the Union Plaza. He said he went into the management and said, hey, I'm the only entertainment director here who isn't skimming money for the mob. What's going on? <laughs> and Augusto, 
is in charge of charming Mitzi Briggs and keeping her unaware. And he has a guy working with him named Carl Thomas. Mm. And Thomas had been seen as this example of how things are changing. He studied hotel management at the university. He comes in clean and they eventually find him on a wiretap with the Savellas in Kansas City and Augusto explaining how the skim works. So their job is to pump the money back to the Midwest and the Midwestern crime families. And Augusto eventually ends up testifying. He turns uh, on a plea deal and he dies. And there was some discussion of the fact that he died at a fairly convenient time. Well, don't know if he did or not, uh, if there was any assistance. But, you know, uh, we're talking about an era when uh, we didn't necessarily know that arteries got that hard. So who knows? <laughs> That's right. And you bring up Lefty Rosenthal. Mm-hmm. Him and Jerry, are, I, did they live in the I know Lefty lived in the trap, right? But did Jerry w- live I, there as well? I think he did. I think he did. And... At one point, Jerry, I guess, was, for lack of a better term, hustling there. Chip hustling. Chip hustling. And that's how they really got to know each other. And I kind of laugh because my dad was a dealer at the Stardust, and he saw the movie Casino, and he said, Sharon Stone doesn't compare. I thought, whoa. Wow. That's a big <laughs> um, statement. Ms. Stone, Ms. Stone is quite attractive. but yeah. you know, Harry Rosenthal was quite the beauty, and Lefty was not. Uh, but, yeah, the Tropicana had that connection. And there are so many ways in which it threads through the history of the community, the strip, you name it. It does. And listeners, let me tell you where it's at today. It's owned and operated by Bally's Corporation. The land is leased from the gaming and leisure property. It occupies 35 acres in the southeast corner of Tropicana and Las Vegas Boulevard. If you've been here, you know exactly what we're talking about. If you haven't been here, by the time this shows up, you're going to be too late to see it. But originally opened with low-rise structures containing 300 rooms, bungalows, and two hotel towers were added in 1979 and 1986. By the 70s, though, the Tropicana was having difficulties competing against the larger newer resorts, and it kind of lost its luster as a luxury property when it was going up against the brand new Las Vegas Hilton and Caesars Palace. So, Michael, my question is, how did the trop last as long as it has? It's an interesting question because sometimes things have a way of working out the opposite of the way you want them to. Here's what I mean. When they finally cleared the mob out of there, Ramada Inns owned it. Okay. So great corporate. This is where Nevada was trying to go in that period. And yet Ramada never really put into it what we would have liked to have seen. And it's gone through a few different ownerships, and each ownership has its own approach. At one point, uh, the Tropicana suddenly had a Calypso theme. And I can remember the ads for the island of Las Vegas. Right. And at one point, they were ready to do a major renovation, and then the economy collapsed. And if you think about it, the Great Recession of 0809, City Center opened, and MGM was on the brink of bankruptcy, trying to open it then. And Boyd Gaming had torn down the Stardust and was planning its own property similar to City Center. And said, no, not during this. And then we had girders standing there on the strip for several years. So Resorts World came in. So the Tropicana at times was caught up in other events. And I think that it had a bit of cachet, if you will, that it was one of the older properties, meaning that they didn't have quite the bells and whistles, which made it a little easier on the pocketbook. Mm. That makes sense. If you compare if you compare it with the MGM across the street. Sure. For example. Or then you go to the other corner, New York, New York. Even the Excalibur, which is now one of the older ones on the strip. Yep. And still a big success, but large. And 
the trap sort of sought its niche. Uh, but at the same time, it really wasn't positioning to compete. So now what's going to be really interesting is the talk of, okay, we're going to have a baseball stadium there and a new resort. What kind of resort exactly? Yep. I've wanted that myself. And, and I don't think they are going to build a mega, mega resort. We're going to have another 5,000 rooms on that corner. Mm-hmm. Nor do I think it's a good idea to. Uh, mind you, I'm not a business person. Uh, I love to tell this story. I was in grad school in New York in the late 80s, and some friends came to me with the Times business section and said, what do you think of this story about your hometown? I said, nobody's going to pay 125 bucks to see Sigrid and Roy. And nobody cares about a volcano. This this mirage is going to be a failure. And so I always say that's why, for example, we're doing this interview and Steve Wynn is selling his estate. (laughs) So I'm not necessarily the guy to ask. But I do think uh, the Tropicana just kind of wound up in that middle ground where there'd be a plan for an expansion, then there'd be a sale. At one point, there was an owner, Aztar, that was going to expand the Tropicana. And then, oh, we have an Atlantic City property, be a better deal to expand there. And in a sense, we we lost the narrative. What do you know about the 1984 labor dispute that resulted in a a bomb blast in the parking lot? Mm. I remember this labor dispute. I I was actually a kid reporter. Uh, Not that I really covered it much. But, you know, we we tend to forget that even if we hear that the culinary union was ready to go on strike recently, that. The relationship between the culinary union and the hotels is much better now than it used to be. And in 84, the culinary had this massive strike. There had been a big one in 76. There was another one in 84. And so there is a bombing. But we're talking here about a time where in the 70s, the culinary under Al Bramlett, who was then the secretary treasurer, there would occasionally be a bomb going off at a restaurant that wouldn't allow unionizing. And by the early and mid 80s, they're cleaning out the culinary. They're getting away from that old mob connection, which they had. But there's still a little bit of that attitude left over. So, you know, they're picketing and they're marching up and down in in the middle of a driveway or whatever. And I don't remember the details necessarily of the bomb. I remember there was one. Now, if they wanted to blow up the Tropicana, Somebody might have done that. I think they were sending a message that they could get tougher. Mm. And if you think about it, if you think of not saying these are all mobsters, but, you know, the mob does a hit on somebody. There's a message to other people. (laughs) (laughs) This is true. Little warning. (laughs) You know, listeners, if you're not familiar with the Tropicana and you don't know its history, I mean, there's been some big time performers that have performed at the Tropicana. It goes all the way back to the likes of Louis Armstrong and Benny Goodman in the Blue Room Lounge. And then there was a striptease review that Jane Mansfield opened in 1958. Currently, they have Purple Rain, the Prince Tribute, and MJ Live, the Michael Jackson Tribute. And I just heard this last weekend that both of them have found new homes. Purple Rain will be at the V Theater at Planet Hollywood. And for a limited time, I heard MJ Live is going to be at the Sahara But then Sammy Davis had played there when it was a superstar theater. It was nicknamed Tiffany's for a while. Gladys Knight had a theater there for her residency. Wayne Newton's been there. Broadway shows such as Mamma Mia and Raiding the Rock Vault have played there. But Michael, in in being such a historian of this town, there's big names that have played at the Tropicana, and this thing's going to come down. What do you remember about its heydays when it was really jumping in, like some of these bigger names were performing there? Well, bearing in mind that when we move here in 67, I'm two years old. So I wasn't hitting the the night spots much then. And I'm a history professor, so I still don't. But I tell you from the history, you go back into the late 50s and the big names you're talking about, the names like Ernie Kovacs, Mm. one of the true early geniuses of television. And the Blue Room, you referred to a couple of them. But that was where they had these incredible jazz performers. So Torme performed there. Benny Goodman. You name them. Uh, Shecky Green, 
performed at the Tropicana. And Shecky Green may have been the greatest sh- local comic in a showroom or lounge. Not necessarily the most famous, but the greatest. Mm-hmm. And something to bear in mind is that in those days, you had the 8 p.m. dinner show, the midnight cocktail show. The midnight cocktail show ends around 1.30 because shows shouldn't run more than 90 minutes because we've got to get them back to the tables. So if Shecky is in the lounge, Sinatra is coming over to watch Shecky. Sammy's coming over, or you've got the Blue Room going, or whatever. So you think of these incredible entertainers, and then this is more trivial. Bowie Berger, part of the attraction for the management, was that there wasn't really a star. Mm. Uh, They did a review originally, and you'd have various stars with the review, And the appeal of a production show is that you don't necessarily have the big name. Well, the first time Siegfried and Roy performed in Las Vegas was at the Tropicana. Wow. In Louis Berger. And Cal Housels Jr. told me the story that uh, they were, I think, rehearsing, and they had a leopard. And the leopard jumped into the orchestra pit. (laughs) And it was a friendly leopard, but it's still a leopard. Right. Right. And the conductor of the orchestra was a guy named Ray Sinatra, who had a cousin who did a few things. <laughs> and he went to Housel's and said, they go or I go. And Housel's thought, well, the, the orchestra conductor is important. He said, of course, he made a mistake. He should have kept Siegfried and Roy. Uh, but, you know, they, they had all of those different acts. And if anyone remembers the Ed Sullivan show, if you think back to Ed Sullivan, the night the Beatles were on, he had like four or five other acts. They didn't do the whole hour. It was a variety show, and that was kind of what the production show would be. So, oh, you're not too excited with this dance group. We're going to have the comedian next, and so on and so forth. But I love to tell this story. There was an adagio dance pair named Zoni and Claire. And Francois Zoni, a Hungarian background like me, uh, was the male half of the group. And the woman... And mind you, they appeared also on Sullivan and other variety shows. And they're performing at the Foley Berger. And Housel's called Claire, whose real name was Nancy Claire, asked her on a date. And they ended up being married well over 40 years. Well, there was a dancer in the Foley Berger named Vasily Sulich. And he and Nancy Housel's were really the guiding forces behind the Nevada Ballet Theater. And so you think, well, the Tropicana Hotel, part of its legacy is our ballet company. Yeah. You wouldn't necessarily think of that. No. But it, that speaks to the variety of entertainers they had there. And, you know, later on, I think Rich Little was performing there as well. And the Tropicana ends up with more of the old names, and I'm not picking on them when I say this. But Wayne Newton, when he was in the Tropicana, was sort of the older Wayne Newton. As I say, not a knock. Wayne Newton still packs him in. Correct. But we're talking about a different approach to entertainment by that point. So there have been waves, you might say, where this has gone on. And you referred to Mamma Mia and doing Broadway shows. Uh, the guy who put in the original entertainment of the Tropicana later was at the Thunderbird, and they were doing two different Broadway shows a night. And if you remember the old Hollywood Squares, Peter Marshall, the host of Hollywood Squares, he was doing those two shows, two different shows every night, and just about killing himself. Uh, so there have been all these different approaches to entertainment here. And if you take the history of the Tropicana from Eddie Fisher coming here opening night, bringing Debbie Reynolds who was his wife, and his good friend Elizabeth Taylor, who becomes a much better friend, and all of these other big names. And then you've got the production show where there are people who go on to become big. And then you've got the Blue Room as kind of a second showroom with jazz, which was not then a big thing on the Strip. A few big names might get in there, but they had the classic jazz groups of the sixties. So it's a rich entertainment history of the trop. It's really a great way to look at the entertainment history of Las Vegas. 
Yes, and in TV and film, it's got a history. Charlie's Angels was filmed there in 78, Designing Women in 92. Robbie Knievel jumped 30 limos there in, in 1998. <laughs> The fifth season premiere of Malcolm in the Middle was there. Let's Make a Deal game show was there in 2009. And there was this little movie in 1972 called The Godfather (laughs) that was filmed at the Tropicana. I find that fascinating because I did not know that The Godfather filmed that scene at the Tropicana. Yeah, and I admit, I was not sure of that. And I believe they used The Tropicana for Diamonds Are Forever. Oh. The Bond and there, there might have been a bit at the Tropicana in Viva Las Vegas. Yeah, with Fo- Foley Bajer is definitely in it. Yeah. So uh, the Tropicana, you, you see all this evidence of the place uh, where it shows up in all of these things. And it's interesting because there's a little bit of history to this history. If I can sound weird. <laughs> I usually sound weird, so it's no big deal. But... If you look at Las Vegas TV shows, films, especially in the 50s and 60s, they're very careful about the image because there were a lot of mob guys who said, you know, we don't want attention. We don't want to look bad. So there were a couple of shows they killed, but they wouldn't cooperate because it would make Las Vegas look bad. And then you've got Elvis and Ann Margaret in Viva Las Vegas. They can't look bad with Elvis and Ann Margaret. <laughs> no. After all, in a Bond movie, you know, that's okay. Uh, the Godfather, uh, by that time, uh, I think there's a little bit of winking going on. The original generation is largely out of there. And that's the generation that's featured in The Godfather. Because they're doing knockoffs of the five families. They're also knocking off the five families, but that's another story. Yeah. But knockoffs of the five families and Don Vito is based on so on and so on. So Las Vegas may have been willing by that time to uh, maybe tolerate a little more. But what the heck, by then Hunter Thompson had been here and written Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So I think we could handle anything. <laughs> what were your thoughts when you first heard that the Tropicana was listed as a potential site for the new stadium? I have to admit, I had a combination of, oh, no, we're going to lose this one. And, well, it has some great potential when you get rid of it. And there are now three of the, call them originals, the Flamingo, the Sahara, and the Tropicana. None of the original Flamingo is standing. No. Now it's all gone. The Sahara still has some, and they have really maintained it and built it up and done a very nice job with it. The Tropicana, years ago, I have to say Mr. Housel even said something like, you know, it's not what it was. And if you think of that low rise, and they still have that section, in 1957, that was state of the art. And in fact, they even charged too much for the rooms at the time. People didn't expect to pay that much for a room, even if it's French provincial or whatever. It has sliding glass doors and a balcony. This is new stuff. And now the Tropicana has, you know, it, there's been a bit of atrophy there, for lack of a better term. And that, I think, has resulted in part from the changes in ownership and so on. So these hotels were not built with the idea of permanence, I think. And the other thing that this involves, and I hate to say it, and but it's also the reality. If you visit Boston, Philadelphia, you want to say, well, where, where was John Adams? Where was Ben Franklin? Mm. People are not coming here saying, I want the 1950s experience. That's not what they're looking for. And I'm not saying this is the case with the Tropicana, but I was reminded of this. When they filmed Casino here in the 90s, they filmed at the Riviera. And they said, why are you doing the Riviera? They said, well, it's got that 70s ambiance. That was not good. It is not good to have a 70s ambiance in the mid-90s. Good point. And there's a bit of that with the Tropicana. It's the old vibe. And yeah, there are people who want that old vibe. But I think the feeling in the industry, right or wrong, is the big money is not with the old vibe. And part of the Tropicana that is iconic, at least to me, 
is the stained glass ceiling. That's 4,250 square feet. Have you heard mm-hmm. of anything? Are they going to try and preserve that or do anything with that ceiling? I have not heard, and God, I hope they do. Me as well. Uh, and this this goes to me as the historian. It's like, okay, uh, the Riviera was the most recent one. Could they save signs for the Neon Museum, say? Could they preserve things from the interior? And there were things preserved. The Mob Museum got some of them. There were, there were others who got them. Papers that tell us the history. I hope they're going to do this with the Tropicana. There are parts of it that are indeed iconic, Mm -hmm. and you can save them. It is possible to do that, and then to have them where people can see them. I hope they're going to save that stained glass, and I hope they're going to have some examples from the classic rooms and what they save from the Foley Berger. I mean, and that pained me. No end. The idea you close a show just before its 50th anniversary made no sense to me. Nope. Uh, Maybe that speaks to the whole problem all along. Uh, But I hope they're going to save some things. And I know that as the time approaches, uh, people who are involved in the industry, whether it's UNLV Special Collection, State Museum, Mob Museum, Neon Museum, are going to be reaching out, if they haven't already, saying, hey, you, you can't let all this go. Let us take stuff. I would think if they do, I'm at least interested. If they sell pieces of that glass ceiling, I'm definitely yeah. interested in getting a piece of it to have as a keepsake. That's for sure. If, if they would do that, I don't even know if they would go down that road. But if they did, I'd be interested. Yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of like old ballparks where they uh, you, you'll sell you an old seat. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Why not? Uh, or may, maybe, maybe you'll end up with the booth you sat in at the <laughs> Tropicana coffee shop. <laughs> what will you miss the most about the Trop? I think... Just its basic existence, because people are going to forget what it meant in its long history in Las Vegas. Uh, Some of it was already gone. There was a Tropicana Country Club. That's long gone. Uh, It's also going to be a bit painful to think about. I don't live far from Tropicana Avenue. And where where's the hotel? Yeah. I hope we're not changing it to A's Avenue or something else. Yeah, I hope they keep it as the Tropicana (laughs) Avenue. But this is the beauty of living in Las Vegas. It used to be Bond Street. And there's still like one sign or something from Bond, the Bond Air Club or something. And at the time, people said, what, you're changing the name to the Tropicana? Bond or something, whatever. Uh, So that's Las Vegas. You know, we... We do preserve important parts of our past, but we also end up imploding uh, the hotel casinos that make a lot of things possible. This is true. I'm going to miss the pool and the bungalows. I always enjoyed <laughs> mm-hmm. to stay at the bungalows, open up the sliding window or the door and, and letting the breeze in. The pool was beautiful. I always loved the pool. And I think when they first started that, were they one of the first or the first to have swim up or floating blackjack tables? Uh, they did a few things that were new. They, I think they were among the first to do that. And they did a couple of other luxury kinds of things with the pools, where, of course, today you think about the pools. It used to be you went to the pool to jump in and swim. Right, exactly. And that, that was the general idea. That's what I do at a pool. But now you know, the cabanas and the entertainment and all kinds of other things. And, again, that's a thing where the Tropicana doesn't come to mind when you think of those kinds of things. Today. True. Yeah, you don't. You don't. Michael, thanks so much for your time and coming on the show and talking about the Tropicana and the history and even all the way from its existence when it was all mobbed up. I appreciate your time. (laughs) (laughs) Glad to do it. Thanks a lot. You are welcome. Listeners, let me tell you about a podcast docuseries I did in support of Native American rights of the harsh and unfair treatment of the indigenous community. I did it with filmmaker Antonino D'Ambrosio. It's entitled A Heartbeat in a Guitar, Johnny Cash and the Making of of bitter tears. I'll put a link in the show notes where you can listen to the entire docu-series. I think you'll enjoy it. That's going to do it for this episode of Before the Lights. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, I salute a chin chin. Chin chin.